The views and opinions expressed on this program are those of the participants and do not reflect the views of BronxNet or the program underwriters. BronxNet. Your voice, your views, your vision. Good evening and welcome to Bronx Talk. On February 26, 17-year-old Trayvon Martin was gunned down by a self-appointed neighborhood watchman named George Zimmerman while walking in a gated community in Sanford, Florida. Zimmerman was not arrested and charged until 45 days later. This has sparked a nationwide debate over profiling, gun laws, and the stand-your-ground laws that exist in several states. A few weeks before that, here in the Bronx, an unarmed teen was chased into his home in the Wakefield section of the Bronx by police, and he was shot dead. And add to that, the NYPD's stop-and-frisk policies have come under fire recently. In fact, there was a citywide protest over them just yesterday. So we've got a lot on our plate tonight for our two guests. We can also take your phone calls. Our number is 718-960-7241. Or you can email questions or comments to us at Bronx Talk at hotmail.com and we read those on the air during a future edition of our program. So for now, please join me in welcoming a Monroe College criminal justice professor who is retired as a 21 year old, 21 year, excuse me, he's much older than 21. <laughs> 21 year NYPD detective and sergeant. In fact, in his criminal investigation course at Monroe this semester, he based his entire final on the Trayvon Martin case. Welcome to Professor Jeffrey Wright. Good evening. Thanks for joining us. Good evening. Us. Thank you. And also a professor at Monroe College and Fordham University who is a practicing clinical sociologist with a special social specialty. worker. Social worker. Right. Excuse me. Clinical so. social worker. I'm sorry. With a specialty in juvenile delinquency, domestic violence, and other relevant subjects. Uh, Dr. Edgar Tyson, thank you for joining thank us. Thank you for having me. All right, now that we got the introductions out of the way, let's roll up our sleeves. A lot of very important issues uh, to talk about uh, tonight, gentlemen, and to our audience. Um, Professor Wright, why do you think it took 45 days to arrest George Zimmerman? You know, that, that is the question. That is the absolute question that this, this, this entire issue is focused on. Um, I believe you have a police agency that just wasn't prepared to do what they were supposed to do. Um, you have a police agency that didn't do due diligence with respect to protocol in terms of arrests. Uh, there was an incident. There was a person that was killed. It wasn't an accident. It didn't appear to be an accident. It wasn't old age. There should have been an immediate arrest. Do you think, just using the, the geography of it, you say that Sanford, uh, uh, the Sanford Police Department was not really uh, ready to do it. Do you think there would have been an arrest, arrest, for example, if it was in New York? Absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, I've, I've investigated homicides, and in a scenario like that, an arrest is, is, is what's, what's, hap it's what's supposed to happen. It absolutely is. I, I do want to uh, get to the uh, Wakefield case a little right. uh, later, but in that case, the, the officers involved have not been charged yet. So, I mean, I wonder mm -hmm. if we're, we've tapped into something that really is a lot larger than just the Sanford police force. Well, you know, there seems to be nationwide a lack of, this is my opinion, uh, this is something That's I'm, why we brought you here. This is, this is something I'm writing about in, in my doctoral dissertation. Um, I, I'd like to call it a lack of responsibility by law enforcement leadership uh, with respect to training issues that, first of all, would prevent these issues from happening, but secondly, that would address them uh, much, much quicker with respect to community, you know, outcry. Community outcry or, and I'm going right for it, or is it a racial issue that, that, uh, the, that uh, the powers that be that run police forces and that do the training are not sensitive enough to the fact that people of color might be on the, on the wrong end of these shootings time and time again? Or is it really, well, they just don't know how to deal with any community? 
You know, the research at this point hasn't necessarily demonstrated that it is strictly a racial issue. I'd like to say it's a training issue, that foremost. Yes, it does appear to be that the... the well, the, let, let, me, let, me ref, let me go one step deeper. Is the training issue as a result of the fact that, that they don't fully examine police tactics properly or uh, community relationships properly, or is it a, a factor that, frankly, well, it's not happening to, um, in plain language, white people, so we're not that interested in pursuing it in, in this way and wow. really going to one step that's necessary to make sure that relationships with communities of color are treated uh, properly. I, I went right for it at the top of the show. Well, I'm sorry. well Gary, you certainly did. Um, but at this point, I, I would just like to say, you know, my research has uncovered or disclosed that it's a training issue, uh, not necessarily related to any racial disparity, but it's a training issue. Okay. I, I mean, it's certainly a fair assessment. It could be that when there's more uh, analysis and more numbers out there, right. then you might come up with a further conclusion. At this moment, you say they're not trained properly. Dr. Tyson, I can, I, <laughs> one thing I've learned, I'm reading his, his body language, he's yeah. dying to get in here. Uh, you, you, without even asking a question, your, your reaction to what you've heard so far. Well, first I want to just, we have to mention the fact that, for example, in this case, in, in the Trayvon Martin case, if you, and I understand Florida very well, I lived in Florida for 12 years, and I work with young folks in the city of Miami, actually, in South Florida, for a very long time. And uh, the area where Sanford is located, the history of Sanford in that particular police station is pretty clear that they have a very problematic relationship with those in the black community. Historically. The, historically. And there's been a number of, so, so, so to, to look at this as an isolated incident, I think is misguided and just not consistent with reality, you know? Mm -hmm. And you mentioned all other cases around here in New York and in other places. I mean, there is clearly a very strong relationship between people's perceptions of race in this country and what has happened to this particular person in this case. I mean, my, uh, Trayvon Martin, was in my view and many people uh, who have any rational sort of understanding of the situation clearly was um, sort of racially charged because he saw a black boy dressed a certain way in a community where he lived he immediately responded with fear and suspicion based on those just those two facts alone well in, in a way I, and i understand uh, what professor wright was saying about about uh, training and all those other things. Uh, you know, the, 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 the bottom line is, in, in the case of George Zimmerman making, making a, a judgment here, he made a judgment and he was not a police officer who was trained. Exactly. He was just a, a member of the community. So that, that training uh, aspect comes in when you deal with why he wasn't arrested. But as far as the incident goes, this was something amiss in him or in the, uh, allegedly in the community uh, you know, at large. Absolutely. It was based on his own. And, and, and let me be clear about something. Today is much more complex, the issue of race. right? It has a lot to do with in this case class because he was in a gated community right where we have certain perceptions about the gated community if you look at these communities now where they see themselves apart from other members of outs members outside that community and so there was a i think there was things in this man's mind that were impacting him in terms uh, of his perception of, of what he was dealing with at that time we're going to go back to professor wright in one second and talk about stand your ground but he claimed that he had his nose broken, he was, uh, and this was the exact quote which um, he told his brother, which was reported on CNN, that he was beaten one punch away of needing uh, to uh, wear diapers and being fed by his brother. It, is your, un I know the two of you were talking about what actually happened. Mm -hmm. That would suggest that he was put upon by Trayvon Martin as opposed to him being the aggressor. Do you believe that that actually happened in there? That Trayvon turned around and, and all of a sudden he attacked the man who was following him? Well, I'm gonna be honest with you, quite frankly, no, no one was there but him and Trayvon. And I'm not sure what exactly happened. It's quite possible that based upon his initial confrontation of Trayvon, Trayvon defended it himself. It's quite possible that Trayvon hit him first or he, I mean, so, so I don't know if we could get into those specifics, but what I do know, based on the 911 call, 
he was clearly following Trayvon and Trayvon and if, if he was the aggressor then who could fault Trayvon for defending himself? Now, and that's a good question, Gary. That's one of the questions I asked my students in the uh, criminal investigation course. You know, one of the questions was, what technology do we use today in investigating, you know, crime? And certainly the video cameras of Mr. Zimmerman that caught him coming into the police station in Sanford after he was in, you know. They, they certainly they, they, belie, would, would suggest that he was not beaten. Absolutely. Certainly not to the degree not that Not to he, the degree he suggests. Exactly. And so, I mean, like the doctor said, nobody was there but those two. However, those cameras certainly, you know, uh, disclose something different than what he said. Let's talk about stand your ground. Now, you know, and, and you both know, as criminal justice uh, professors, whether you like the law or not, mm. it still is the law. Now, this law says that if you th feel threatened with imminent uh, bodily harm, you can use force, including guns, against the person you find threatening, even if there's an opportunity to retreat. That would suggest an, an open-door policy for if he can just basically testify in court that, you know what, I felt threatened, and therefore, and we, again, we weren't there, and therefore I was within my rights, whether we like the law or not, to, to use the gun and, and, and frankly defend myself. It, it, could that be a reasonable defense? And, you know, that was the standard by which he was not charged uh -huh. and arrested. So, right. you know, obviously, that's what the Sanford police, and at that time, I believe it was the district attorney, believed that mm -hmm. that stand your ground law was applicable in that situation. Um, I, I think he can't, he can't re repeal from it. He has to stay with that. Well, and so your <clears throat> earlier comment about training, you're saying that maybe they weren't really trained well enough to fully understand what might have happened there or to immediately pounce on the possibilities of what might have happened on that night. The Sanford police? Yes. I have no idea what type of training they went under because there was no crime scene. So the fact that there was no crime scene... What, what do you mean by that? Well, they didn't make it a crime scene. They didn't scene. make it a crime scene. There was an incident. There was a crime. There was a murder. Right. And this is PD 101. You make a crime scene as large as possible. I, I was not aware of that. So, yeah. th so they yeah. didn't uh, identify oh, the absolutely places. not. No. And, and because they did not make a crime scene, and my students know this, that's the first thing I pounded into them. <laughs> a, crown, a crime scene is extremely important in any investigation because it allows you to look for evidence. Mm -hmm. You know, whether it's, it's blood or, or, or any, any other type of material. So that evidence. even if ultimately, uh, it, you know, it turns out that there was some justified activity there, at least it's been documented. Exactly. I would think that, a, a, knowing what I know about the NYPD, they would have identified that as a crime scene or oh, a potential absolutely. crime scene right away, absolutely. even if they ultimately wouldn't charge somebody or whatever. But, but here's the problem in this case, in this law. Um, in addition to, I think, the... the, the clear racial undertones in this in this issue the law allowed this police department to take the word of the mm -hmm. man who the only other person at the scene they took his word for what he said and then they literally let him walk away doing minimal investigation if any because if any because as my colleague said they did not declare it a, a, a crime scene and take the necessary steps to investigate a crime scene which is the problem with this law. This law allows police on the spot to make a determination on whether there was a crime committed. In my neighborhood, we have a, um, a neighborhood watch and they drive around in a car. I'm reasonably certain they are not armed. How much of the problem here is about guns, guns in Florida, and gun availability? I'll, I'll I think it's a major that. part of the problem. Because oh, many of the, uh, many of the editorials a, say that this is really about guns oh, more I, than anything else. Well, it's, it's a large yeah, part has yeah. to do with guns because if I looked at some of the data, since 2005, there has been <clears throat> almost a three times the amount of homicides related where, where, where the defense has been self-defense. You see, it has even encouraged more use of this mm -hmm. term self-defense in, in, in murders. In fact, uh, the number, uh, and I pulled the same thing out of my own research, that a 300 percent, which is three times, right. uh, increase in the number of killings Absolutely. by private citizens with the, that self-defense justification in Florida Absolutely. since this law passed. Um, are we at a point now, and this is a deep 
uh, okay. philosophical question where we should challenge the constitutional right to bear arms or is there a way to accept that constitutional right to bear arms and still um, make it so that guns don't move from state to state and get them out of the hands of people who are going to do the wrong thing? I think challenging, <clears throat> I think challenging the Constitution would be challenging. I think what we should do, I think it would be challenging and, you know, you don't want to start doing something where you're not going to get any ground. What I think should happen is the gun laws, the lobbyists, it should be stricter. They should be stricter. Yeah. From what I understand... You're talking marking the casings and all these other things that... Well, there's, there's so many things that can be done. From what I understand, and I'm not sure, uh, but Mr. Zimmerman had, he didn't have a record, but he was arrested. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. that might be, that might demonstrate what his character is right. with respect to... I, I do want to go to the phone, but I want to interject that we became aware, the public became aware of Trayvon Martin's background before we became aware of the man who did the shooting. I thought that was a, a he, remarkable... He was profiled uh, twice, in his life and in his death, he was profiled. Uh, I, I'm going to extend that to the young man in Wakefield in just a moment, and, but I do want to talk to our friend Mark from Pelham Parkway who joins us. Hi, Mark. How are you? Hey, Gary. Professors, doctors, whatever. Uh, let me turn down my phone. I'm going to make some good ob observations on this. Well, you make them and we'll determine if they're good. Okay. First of all, I've done some research on this because we're doing a report on it as well. Florida, Sanford, Florida, and most of Florida, like New York City and New York State and in most countries, have a thing called obstruction of government administration, which means when a member of the police force or any state troopers or a representative of the police force tells you, stay out of it, you're supposed to stay out of it. First well, of all... We, we know that he didn't do that. Right, he didn't. As a fact, he followed him. They told he they have it verbally. So his defense of self-defense is even under their law, if you look at it well, and that's why I think they finally arrested him, is because the fact he disobeyed a direct order from a representative right. of the police force. That's one in Florida. Okay. Number two... Mark, I want to move it along. Do you have a question or you want to make one well, more statement? Well, then I have a question, and this is going to relate to us in New York City. Every time they have a shooting by police officers, and I'm going to go back to the Amadou Diallo case, mm -hmm. Doris Mon case, and even this young gentleman... The first thing the police come out say, after they get caught with their pants down and they're unarmed, they say they weren't trained right, we're going to implement training. If you go back to the Amadou, da, Amadou Diallo. Diallo case 10, year, 10 years ago, um, so I, if, I, I if, got they, it. if they've what, improved so your, your training, question is how come it's not implemented got properly? It. This is the, <laughs> the gentleman will verify that I asked them this question actually before we started the show. And Professor Wright, I guess that goes to you. So have there been, and let's just talk from our uh, police force here in New York, have there been significant changes in the training uh, for sensitivity and all these other issues since uh, all the way back uh, when Diallo was shot? I'd like to answer that by saying how many cases have there been since Diallo? We, we know there are many. Right. So, so, so your, your, your <clears> feeling <throat> is... My response is no. no and no. even if there have been, they haven't been sufficient. They haven't been effective. Well, I want to say that, I mean, there has to be accountability as well. That's that, what it is. See, because there's very few cases, and I'm not sure how many, but there's very few cases that we all can point to where these incidents have happened and people were held accountable. And I think if that begins to happen, in addition to the training, which I believe training is very, very important, but if you slip up as it, irrespective of your training, you ought to be held accountable. Romali Graham uh, tragically was shot dead. I talked about at the top of the show that uh, he was uh, followed into his home by police who had uh, apparently some suspicions. Uh, we were talking about it before the show. They were, they were not charged. It would suggest, and certainly the community feels, there is no accountability here. Absolutely. Right. And that's why right. you see the outrage. And a lot of people are questioning some of the anger and frustration. And it's very difficult to justify not either arresting this, this, this uh, Zimmerman in this case or arresting or uh, uh, effectively dealing with officers when they make these kinds of uh, errors in their judgment, in their training, um, and then not expect people to be upset about it. You've right. got to expect people to be upset about it. Uh, let's go to Robert from the South Bronx. Haven't heard from you in a while. Robert, how are you? Yeah, Gary, we talk on Facebook enough, I think, but... I know, Robert uh, said, when I'll are you let, doing you know, this story? And I said, we're doing it on April 16th, so here we are. That's go. right. Now, um, uh, two questions. Number one is, all these cases, at the end of the day, 
the victims are all black. Now, is it is it you know if it wasn't for Reverend Al Sharpton, you know a lot of these cases would go, you know just you know nothing would be done. Now the Green case in the Bronx, we have a black district attorney that does a poor job in prosecuting, takes forever. But at the end of the day, why is it always a person of color? The White Plains gentleman was a person of color. Right. The Pace student was a person of color. It's always a person of color. Well, now, some of these shootings were mixed up with maybe some white people or some Arab people. Then maybe there wouldn't be so many question marks. But it's always right. a person of color. Robert, now, uh, I'm, you know, I'm going to... When, 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 when people say about the Zimmerman case, once again, you ask we what justice. Uh, Robert... Okay? Uh, Thank you very much for the call. Uh, Dr. Tyson, that seems like a question you wrestle with in class every day. Absolutely, because, again, there are so much, there are so much problems with the, the um, belief that racism is not an issue in this case, in these cases. Given the fact, as the caller said, clearly most, if not all, of these cases are centered around so, you know, If you were to list them all and you'd say, gee whiz, what's the one thing right, they all right, have in right, common? It's right, obvious. Right. So, so here's the question. Let me rephrase Robert's question. How do we address this? Because these are, not, they, they lead to the training problems. Mm -hmm. They lead to the perception problems that caused George Zimmerman, allegedly, to chase, uh, mm -hmm. you know, Trayvon mm -hmm. through the, the community. Mm -hmm. How do we get to the point where uh, we, we break this down or at minimum on the police community relation level get it so that there's a symbiotic understanding between the two because people don't trust the police either mm -hmm. sometimes for good mm -hmm. reasons it's it's a huge problem that starts really with how we raise each other as children and as people i mean in our homes how do you talk to your child about issues around race how do you talk to your child around issues around you know differences in terms of class and gender how do we talk to our children about um understanding the value of human beings above ab above and beyond their race and, and their it, gender this is not the kind of thing we can pass a law because the laws exist <laughs> well, <laughs> that, that that will change it um, you, you want to well, respond to that well, and then well, i want to get into the stop and frisk okay. thing which is all i'm saying connected Gary, to everything we're talking is about. that there has to be leadership accountability leadership law enforcement leadership police leadership has to say throughout the country there is a problem. They have to recognize that these incidents earmark a problem. And, and, and until that's done, until the leadership says, you know, wow, there is a problem in our industry, then the problem can't be addressed. When, when you uh, look at the uh, stop and frisk incidents and, and when the numbers came out, I, I, I took a moment to really absorb them. 684,000 stop and frisk incidents last year. A uh, simple arithmetic, t arithmetic tells you that's 1,873 in a 365-day uh, calendar. That's a lot of uh, stop and frisks. The police department, Ray Kelly and the mayor, and they all defend this as being an effective tactic. You want crime to go down? It's the only way we can do this. What's your response to stop and frisk? Yeah. Is it, is it an, an effective tactic? And is it helping, or in the long run, is it hurting because it's starting this cycle of, uh, you know, uh, it's uncomfortability between well, people? Well, Gary, it's continuing a cycle of distrust and friction between the police and the community. And statistically, um, the stop and frisk uh, tactic has not significantly reduced gun crime. So you're continuing with uh, a process, a tactic, that the community is in uproar about, but it's not, it's not effective. It's not doing what the police say it's supposed to uh, I guess I should add to that, between 2005 and 2008, less than 1% of those stop and frisks were right. a, a right. weapon. Or it, 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 it is not producing the effect that it's uh, Again, a, a core question that possibly neither of you can answer. Well, then why does the city keep doing it? Is, are they, frankly, out of ideas on how to properly police communities? I'll let you address well, that first. And then we'll that's, that's a really good question. You know, the, the commissioner was addressing uh, the city council when this very issue and he flipped the question on them in terms of coming up with some ideas of what to do. He asked cal uh, a Bronx council member Melissa Mark Viverito that question. That's 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 okay but the, the problem with that uh, Gary is that he's the commissioner it's his job not her job I mean she's not supposed to come up with the ideas her constituents are saying that this is a problem. 
I, it's I'm, causing friction. I'm, I'm only smiling because I wished I was at the butt end of that question because my response, and I'm sorry I'm jumping in as, as a guest right here, but my response would be let's find better and more activities for our young people to do, and then they will be in trouble less, and then you will have less of this issue. But uh, that's there, my there, there are other comment. ideas that could work. Uh, for example, uh, one of the things police can do is, is try to find out ways in which to have the better relationships with people's in the, people in the community. For example, community policing. Community policing, which involves um, spending time in the community, doing community activities. And once in a while in the summer, the police will do certain kinds of activities in New York City in which uh, there is more of an... Uh, an activity you of know, celebration, right, right, or right, something, something like or a block party, event, a sure. community event. That way, at least you begin to have relationships with community and, and citizens where there's not always a confrontation at, at, at Professor hand. Wright, do they put enough resources into those things, your perception of the police department as it's configured right now? I think they make an effort. I think they do. They do make an effort. I think they make an effort. I think they make a sincere effort, but some, you know, it's counterbalanced by the, the stop and fish, which is causing a lot of friction and discontent from the community. Uh, Dr. Tyson, you talk with a lot of young people, um, and, and we talked about it briefly before the show, and I told you I didn't want to talk about it until we get to the show. Are young people behaving advisedly, I don't want to say properly, but advisedly when they're stopped by police, or do, in other words, do they understand what the unfortunate potential is, even if they're in the right, uh, when they get stopped? And is there advice out there? Should there be advice for young people, especially law-abiding young people, on how to handle these things, even if they're in the right, even if they've done nothing wrong and don't, frankly, deserve to be stopped? Classic question. Very important question. I was told that way by my father. It's something that most young black um, men in, 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 in urban communities are always told in terms of be very careful that what kinds of move you make, what kinds of words you out of your mouth, how do you talk back to police officers. Now, we're, the, we're, we're just about out of time. So the bottom line is, give me, give me a couple of words that summarizes it. We always tell each other to be careful when we are police officers, <laughs> yes. but, but that yes. doesn't always stop the confrontation from escalating. Gentlemen, uh, Professor Wright from uh, Monroe College and uh, Dr. Tyson from Monroe and Fordham University, obviously this is a dialogue we need a, at least another hour at for, least, but least, we'll have you back and hopefully it'll be because things are going so well and not because <laughs> of tragic incidents like this. That Thank would be you. great. Thank I you. I do appreciate your time. Me. Folks, if you have further comments or questions on anything you heard on tonight's show, or anything going on in the Bronx, and email them to us at bronxtalk at hotmail.com, and we'll read those on the air during a future edition of our program. Archives of the show are available at bronxnet.org. You click Bronx Talk on the right-hand navigation bar, and also uh, please become a fan of Bronx Talk on Facebook, just like Robert from the South Bronx did. Uh, Bronx Talk Monday nights at 9 on Bronxnet Cablevision 67, Verizon Fios 33. Thanks to our producer, Jane Floro, to Sean, who was the director tonight, and to Dina and all the cast of thousands around us, and to uh, one of Dr. Tyson's students who came here to see him, <laughs> and to you, good night. We'll see you.